Um, so system architecture is basically about um, the early high-level design decisions that you make about a system. Um, so there are many definitions out there. Some of them are sort of related to um, what people call the concept. A concept is basically a high-level abstraction of a system that sort of guides uh, the rest of the design process. So for example, if you're talking about a house, a concept for a house would be something like, like um, are we building a beach house? Are we building a, a colonial style house? Are we building a, a ranch style house, right? So once that you have designed your, defined your concept, you sort of can, uh, you have a much better idea of the system that you're, that you're designing and it, it sort of helps um, uh, make the rest of the design decisions. So people uh, say that it drives ambiguity out of the design process. Uh, so that's one idea uh, which is essential to system architecture. There are other um, ideas. So um, it's also typically mentioned that is a mapping between the function and the form of a system. So those terms are borrowed from actual architecture, civil, arch civil architecture. Um, so uh, function basically is what the system does, right? So I do a lot of work about Earth observing satellites. Uh, so what do Earth observing satellites do? Basically take measurements of different parameters of the Earth, um, um, the land, the atmosphere, the ocean, and so forth. So that's the function. Um, and the form is really what the system is made of, the part, the component, the subsystem. So in the case of the satellites, we're talking here about um, uh, the solar panels, the computers, um, the radiators and so forth, right? So um, in system architecture, it's very typical to separate function from form and then to um, specify what are the relationships between function and form. So basically, uh, what are the main functions that the system needs to do? What are the main elements of form? And who does what, basically? So that's uh, another idea which is typical um, uh, in definitions of system architecture. Um, the idea that uh, we use um, most often in our research group is an idea um, um, that started basically with, um, uh, I think it really started in our research group, in Professor Crowley's group and, and people like Bill Siemens, that uh, the architecture process uh, is really a decision-making process. So this uh, um, mapping between function and form and definition of the concept, it's really all about making decisions. And really, uh, they're not that different from other types of decisions. And therefore, the implication of that is that we can go to the decision analysis literature, we can use decision support tools um, to support the system architect when they're um, making uh, system architecture decisions. Um, so just to give you an example of that, um, I could say that uh, for an Earth observing satellite, the architecture would be composed of the 10 um, or so first decisions that you have to make about a system. So those would be things like, um, what are the instruments that I'm going to fly in the satellite? Um, am I flying a radar, a radiometer, a sounder? What, what combination of instruments? Uh, what are the orbits? Do I uh, fly those instruments in a low Earth orbit, 400 kilometers, sun synchronous, not sun synchronous? Uh, or do I fly them on a geostationary orbit? A geostationary orbit is uh, one that is synchronized with the uh, period of rotation of the Earth. So basically, um, um, from the point of view of an observer on the surface of the Earth, it looks like the satellite is st uh, still in the sky, always in the same position. Um, so really for Earth observing satellites, it's all about instruments, um, orbits. Um, there's also something about um, the trade-off between large and small satellites, right? Uh, if you choose a set of instruments and a set of orbits, you still have the choice of putting all the instruments in a big satellite or you can separate them across multiple smaller satellites. Um, some people call that uh, fractionated architectures. Uh, so that's uh, a, key, a key decision, a key architectural decisions for Earth observing systems. So that's, that's, that's just an example of how you can encode uh, the architecture of a system, in this case an Earth observing system, as a series of decisions that you have to make. Um, so if you do that, Basically, then you can use all sort of decision support tools to analyze your system architecture. And really what you want to do is to come up with uh, many different possibilities for the architectures and then come up with some way to evaluate those possibilities and then uh, hopefully choose one or two architectures that you want to analyze in more detail. Um, so that's that process, sometimes people call it the system architecting process. It's really an invented word, um, but it's, it's really just 
selecting, choosing a system architecture. So basically what you want to do in the system architecting process is to um, be able to enumerate a few candidate architectures, evaluate them, and then be able to down-select hopefully one or two architectures that you want to study in more detail. Um, so the typical way in which that has happened in the past is basically a 100% human process. Uh, in the sense that there is one system architect or a very reduced team of system architects that based on their experience and expertise um, sort of identifies a reduced, let's say, four or five different architectures. So for the case of the Earth observing satellite system, uh, they could say, okay, so option number one, it's going to be a very large satellite uh, in LEO with these 10 instruments with the radar, radiometer, sounder, et cetera, et cetera. Option number two is going to be two satellites flying in uh, sort of uh, in a tandem configuration, sort of uh, synchronized with each other, um, where you know each is going to have half of the payload, basically. Um, option number three is going to be uh, an approach where each instrument fly, each instrument flies on a different platform, for instance, and so forth. Um, so the typical way that that um, that we did system architecting in the past was. Uh, system architects identifying these alternative architectures and then based on their previous expertise and experience and uh, based on their expert knowledge, they really um, uh, decided upon uh, one or two architectures that were worth studying in more detail. What we do uh, in the system architecture research field is try to um, improve that process. Uh, the problem obviously is that um, because this is a 100% human process, you're subject to things like the bias. Uh, of uh, human bias, which is, you know, we have limitations in terms of uh, um, our ability to compute. We have limitations in terms of our ability to make decisions. We, we are biased because of our uh, finite knowledge of things. Um, so obviously, uh, those are things that we would like to improve. So the, there's basically two directions, two things we want to improve. One is um, the breadth, really the number of alternatives, the number of architectures that we're considering, and then um, the other one is sort of getting rid of this bias, sort of getting more consistency uh, in the evaluation and in the selection process. So one way of doing that, in, which is the way that, that we have pursued in the past a lot, is to try to um, come up with a model for, for an architecture. And when I, when I say a model, I really mean a computer model, something that you can um, really enumerate with a computer. So, uh, just to give you an example, if you're interested in the Earth observing satellite system in these um, two decisions, for instance, let's put a very simple example, just uh, uh, the selection of the instruments and the selection of the orbits and which instruments go into which orbits. Um, so one very simple way of um, creating a model for that would be to have a, a matrix, a binary matrix, where you would have uh, instruments in the rows and then satellites in the columns and then each element of the matrix would be either zero or one depending on whether that instrument is selected for that orbit, yes or no, basically. Um, so that's a very simple model for an architecture of an EOS and it's a model that is good for some reasons and not so good for other reasons. It's very good for uh, numeration, obviously, because a binary matrix is something that you can very easily enumerate. It's not so good from the, uh, I guess, visualization um, or uh, user perspective because it's hard to, when you see one of those matrices, it's hard to understand what that means really. Um, so once you have that model, there are um, algorithms that you can use to enumerate, uh, for instance, let's say that you want to enumerate all of the possible binary matrices that you have. Um, and then if you have some way, some metrics to evaluate them, you can sort of write an algorithm that, you, that will uh, compute the metrics for all of those possibilities, and then you can uh, plot basically, uh, let's say that you have cost and science as your metrics, you could uh, plot uh, science versus cost in a chart, and each point uh, in the chart would be one architecture, so that, that chart is called a trade space chart, and that would give you an idea of uh, you know, which architectures are better. So uh, this idea of uh, trade space chart is actually very important in model-based system architecture because it gives you a lot of information. Um, first of all, it gives you a, uh, an idea of the range of performance and the range of cost that you can achieve if performance and cost are the two metrics of interest. You can very rapidly see what is the range of performance that you can achieve and cost uh, based on the architectural decisions and options that you decided upon. Um, uh, secondly, it's very easy also to identify architectures that are very bad. Um, so those architectures are um, 
dominated. It's called uh, Pareto dominance. And what that really means is um, something that's very easy to understand by everyone. So if I have an architecture that uh, gives me less science and is more expensive than another one, that's a dominated architecture. No one, no rational decision maker would choose that option uh, in the absence of more information upon, an, upon the other one, right? So that's um, something that you can very easily do, get rid of uh, heavily dominated architectures. Um, there's also some more information that you can get from the structure of the trade space. Sometimes you see that the points, the architectures in the chart will, uh, will appear in clusters. Um, so what that really means is that there's sort of families of architectures um, that have, with different values of decisions, uh, they achieve very similar uh, metrics, in this case performance and cost. So what that really is telling you is that there's, perhaps there is one or maybe a very reduced set of decisions that are actually driving most of, that, most of that performance or most of that cost. And if you can identify which decision or decisions that is, uh, it's something very important because uh, that's a decision that you should make, uh, you know, uh, that you should give priority, you should make uh, very early because that's gonna drive most of your ability to meet uh, the needs of your stakeholders, of course. So essentially summarizing, system architecture really can be seen as a decision-making process. It's really about making decisions, making architectural decisions. Uh, and therefore, a lot of the future research is gonna be related to how we can improve decision-making tools for the purposes of system architecture.